Welcome to Bandit's Keep. I'm Daniel. In this video, we're going to talk about hand-to-hand -hand combat. So it, this came back up in a conversation recently with me because I was talking to KR over from D&D &D Homebrew, and uh, we do a podcast together. If you don't know that, uh, link in the show notes, Monsters and Treasure. But anyways, we were talking about how I use original Dungeons and Dragons and chainmail and how kind of mass combat works and the idea of if they were surrounded, let's say in this case, he was talking about having a single character surrounded by like eight or 10 orcs, like, or 50 orcs, like how would that work? And, you know, I said, ultimately, if there was that many of them and they'd, they would try to probably overpower you, right? Isn't that what they would likely do? I mean, I suppose they could just come in with their swords, but, you know, for cool fantasy trope, getting captured by the orcs is much cooler. And we just started talking about how that would work. Now, my system that I've developed here, if you want to call it that, is very much a twist on or an expansion on what Gary Gygax talks about in Strategic Review, I believe it's number two, where he talks about unarmed combat. And the way that he does it is similar. I will talk about what I do differently and why I do it differently as we go through it, but this is a very similar take to what they were doing right at the very beginning, and I think it works pretty darn well. So we're going to jump over here to my iPad and let's take a look. Okay, so this is version 2.2. Uh, by the way, I will put a link to this in the show notes. So if you want to follow along, just pause the video, download it, come back and you can follow along. Otherwise I'll have it up on the screen here. So let's take a look. This is 2.2 because I'm always adjusting this, although it's been a while and uh, I got some stock art there. So this is basically just a setup. Now here's some differences. So I'm going to jump right into this quickly. I'm going to read through this and I'll talk about what I do different than what Gygax does. So so this is the standard unarmed combat. This is the procedure that we use when none of the combatants uh, choose to use weapons. This includes uh, claws and bites. Both sides roll initiative. The winner gets the edge, which gives her an extra d6 to her dice pool for the round. If a tie occurs, neither side gets the edge. If one side has surprise, they automatically get the edge. Okay. Each side rolls a number of d6s equal to their hit dice or level. This is their dice pool. If more than one opponent is attacking a single fighter, their hit dice are combined. All of the d6s are totaled, and the total difference between them is subdual damage dealt to the losing side. If fighting more than one opponent, this can be focused on a single combatant or spread out evenly amongst the group, rounded down. On a tie, both, both parties struggle, neither able to take action. When a combatant drops to zero hit points or below through subdual damage, they are unconscious for two to eight turns and can be captured or finished off. Subdual damage is healed one hit point per turn of rest. Okay, so just to make this clear, you come into combat, you roll initiative. If you have initiative, you basically add an extra d6 to your dice pool. And both sides roll their dice pools. D6 is equal to their hit dice or level. You add up the total number of pips. Pips, I'm talking like OD&D. &D. The one with the most, you know, the difference there, they do the damage to the other side. Now, how is this different than the strategic review? Well, in Gygax's example, he makes each of the combatants roll a two-hit roll. He also, then he just takes those that hit and he... Uh, adds those, you know, those are the ones that get to roll a d6 per hit die. Now, the other thing he does is that if you win, you throw the opponents off and they are stunned for a number of rounds equal to the number of pips. Now, I tried this at first. And first of all, rolling all the two hit rolls was kind of a pain, especially because it normally happens when there's large groups. But also, I like the idea of just simplification here. So I removed that. You may want to leave that in if you think this is too simple or too easy, if you will. You can also clearly add modifiers, right? If somebody's in plate mail armor and you're not, you might say, well, maybe they have an advantage because you can't hurt them as easily. But then you could also argue, well, you're faster than they are. So I kind of thought it was a wash and I left it. The stunning thing, which I you'll see I add as an option, is very powerful. And I thought to myself, that the first time I used it, actually, somebody got in combat with a couple of orcs and the orc orcs won and they threw the fifth level fighter or whatever because they rolled really low uh, down and stunned them for three rounds and the orcs walked up and cut their throat. So I decided maybe that was a little too powerful. So I have a little example here. We'll run through it. I mean, I, hopefully that's pretty clear. And honestly, this first page is all you need. 
you could run this just like this. And oftentimes this is all I deal with, but there are little add-ons that I added over time. But let's, let's just do an example so you can see how this works. Bob the Bard is seen leaving the window of the local blacksmith's daughter by her three brothers. They chase him down a dead-end alley with the intention of beating the stuffing out of him. Bob is a fourth-level thief, 12 hit points, and the brothers are normal men with one hit die each, three, five, and two hit points. Round one. Initiative is rolled, Bob, four, brothers, six. The brothers have the edge. Thus, roll four d6. One each, plus one for winning initiative. Bob rolls four d6 as well. Bob, 12, brothers, 15. Bob takes three hit points of subdual damage. Round two. Initiative is rolled, Bob, five, brothers, two. Bob gets the edge and an extra d6, so he rolls 5d6 against the brothers 3d6. Bob 12, brothers 12. Since it's a tie, neither side takes damage and the fight continues. Round three. And by the way, I'll also point out when I do these examples, I actually play them out. So this is actually what happened. Round three. Initiative is rolled. Bob three, brothers one. Bob gets the edge and the extra d6. He rolls 5d6 against the brothers 3d6. Now Bob gets 20, the brothers 13. Bob comes back hard doing seven points of damage. Since he doesn't know how strong the brothers are, he chooses to focus all the damage on one of them, and it's enough to knock out brother number one, determined randomly from the fight. Round four initiative is rolled. Bob two, brothers three. The brothers get an edge, an extra d6, so they roll three d6, because remember now there's only two of them, against Bob's four d6. Bob rolls an eight, Ugh. brothers 16. Bob takes eight hit points of damage and is down to one hit point. Round five. Initiative is rolled, Bob 6, Brothers 4. Bob gets the edge, so he's rolling 5d6 against the Brothers 2d6. Bob rolls a 15, Brothers roll a 5. Bob does 10 points of damage. Uh, this time he decides to chance it and spread them out, since he took them out pretty easily before, doing 5 hit points each, and both Brothers go out cold. At this point, it will take one round each to kill the Brothers if Bob wanted, but all he really wants is a drink, so he grabs the silver from their pockets and heads to the local pub. It will take 11 turns, about two hours of rest for Bob to heal back. All right, so that's how it works if you're not using any weapons. But what if somebody has a weapon? Let's jump into standard melee. Don't worry, I'm not going to read the examples for all of these, but we'll go through them really quickly. Uh, if a combatant wins initiative and decides to attack with a weapon instead, they roll attack and damage per normal melee. After this is resolved, both sides roll the d6s above, but neither side gets the edge, right? Uh, this is true if even one person, in the case of a group attack, uses a weapon. If initiative goes to the weaponless fighter, they get the edge, and no normal melee attacks can, can be made this round as everybody's involved in the grapple. So in other words, if you don't have a weapon and somebody has a weapon, this gives you the chance, if you win initiative, to basically dive in on them. Like This is that classic scene where somebody comes at you with a sword and you just jump on them and you're wrestling. It, it allows it so that you actually have a chance. Right. If you win initiative, they can't attack you with their weapon that round. And obviously, if it wasn't obvious before, we saw in the example with Bob, you can always choose to attack multiple people. Right. So if you've got three goblins in front of you and they, you know, you just broke out of the, the jail cell and they come at you with their swords, you can charge them. And if you're a fifth level fighter or a third level fighter or whatever and think you have enough hit dice to do it, you can choose to attack all of them. So you can choose to focus on one or attack many. That is up to you. So, again, I have an example here, which you can read through if you get the document. And let's get into some other rules. So here's some advanced rules. Because a Bob the Bard is a thief, I decided to think about what backstabbing would do. And again, you can use this or not. Uh, when attacking by surprise, the attacker gets the edge, which we've already talked about. But when a thief attacks by surprise, which would be their backstab, they add 1d6 per level to their dice pool for that first round. So if they're part of a group, though, that's not the case. So it's only the single thief attacking by surprise. So basically your backstab. I also have rules here for stunning and pinning. Uh, when all the d6 are total and the difference between them is noted, the winning side has several options. You can cause the damage, like I said. You can cause them to be stunned for a number of rounds equal to the difference, and I'll talk about what that means in a second. Or you can pin them. If you pin an opponent, uh, you know, then uh, again, it's a special case. So these are almost like conditions if you want to think about like in 5e. So let's take a look at what these things mean. Stunning. Uh, when stunning multiple opponents, it's divided evenly. A stunned opponent's speed is quartered and they cannot attack, but they can still defend. That means that like, if you decide to keep grappling them, they'll be able to fight back. But if you want to run, you can do that. Or if you attack them with a sword or something, they, can't, they won't be able to defend themselves that way. Uh, they automatically lose initiative and you get the edge. So for instance, you could 
grapple somebody, stun them, and then pull your dagger out and stab them the next round, they wouldn't be able to return a blow, and you would automatically get initiative. And again, we have a an example. Pinning and holding. Once overpowered, a combatant may only attack with a dagger, with a minus four to hit, or try to escape by grappling, rolling a number of d6 as normal, but dividing the total by two rounded down. So once you get pinned, the chance of you getting away is pretty slim. So pinning is very powerful. Again, both stunning and pinning are really powerful. I oftentimes don't use these unless it's a very specific situation. I usually just go with the basic grappling rules, but they're here if you want to do it. And one final thing I have here, because I don't want to make this too long, is we talk about the classic for the thief, which is using a the pummel of your dagger or a sap or a blackjack, right? Something to knock somebody out, because that's kind of it. And also a garrot. Or is it a garret? Let me know in the comments below. Is it garret or garrot? I think it's garrot. If a thief uses a sap, blackjack, or, or the pummel of the dagger when attacking by surprise, they add their dice as described above and add a plus one per level. Thus, a third level thief attacking by surprise, backstab, with the pommel of his dagger will roll 6d6 plus three. So that works out to be 3d6 for their level, doubled because they're a thief, and then plus three because of the pommel. I have some costs here for them. So in, in other words, it's a pretty decent thing for that. If you are just using it as a weapon, it barely does any damage, so it's really for that backstab moment. So I also have the garrot here, which is, of course, an assassin's weapon, so how that plays out in your world, right? Um, this is this does real damage as opposed to subdual damage, which makes sense, right, with the garrot, and it has a couple of little side rules. If it's used during normal non-surprise combat, the thief has to subtract 1d6 from their attack, and anybody else has to subtract 2d6 until they get the lock on them, from, you know. So basically... You don't use a karate, you don't pull it out and fight somebody like this with it. Although we've sometimes seen that in movies, which is a little bit weird, but it's really made for sneaking up and taking care of business. It's definitely an assassin's weapon and something that, you know, depending on the characters, they may or may not want to use it. But it's in here if you want to play around with it. And I even say that lawful folk frown upon the use of a garrot. So the main reason why I created this was because I really wanted to create a system where not just the player characters, but the enemies had a way to capture because I find that to be a good option. You know, sometimes I've seen people play it where the it's basically a TBK and then it's like, well, you wake up because you didn't actually die. They saved you. That can work too. But this has a different mechanic. The orcs put their swords away and try to tackle you and take you down. It's a different thing than just saying, oh, well, you didn't die because I decided that you should have been captured. So I like it. It works for me. I would love to know what you think. I've seen some modifications. I'll give you a few other ways people have used it. They change it to instead of 1d6 per level or hit die, they do the hit die. So like a magic user or a thief would roll d4s, a fighter would roll d8s, clerics would roll d6s. You could do that. They also sometimes modify it, again, based on armor or they don't allow armor or they'll say something like you have a penalty to attack them if they're in heavy armor, uh, but they always go last. So it kind of is a wash. Again, I don't do that, but I've seen people do it with this system. There's lots of ways to modify it. I would love to know if you use something like this, if you've used this, because it's been out there for a while. I put it out there uh, on my podcast. And if you use unarmed combat in general, like how do you handle it? What would you do with the monk in this situation? Because I don't use monks, so it's not really a problem. But when you throw a monk into there, all of a sudden unarmed combat becomes even weirder to me. So I'd love to know what you think about this, about monks, about things in general. I was going to say life in general, but let's keep it RPG related in the comments. If you have been enjoying this video, please do like it and share it around. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Check out the show notes. Like I said, there'll be a link to this document. There's also a link there to a bunch of other stuff and to my Discord where you can join the conversation over there. There's a link to my Patreon as well if you want to support the channel and I'll talk to you soon.